Thank you, everyone. And sorry I couldn't be there in person with you. Um, I'd, I'd like to say this is not totally research. I'm, I'm hoping that we're advancing from research towards something a bit more practical. And the aim of today's quick uh, presentation is to give you an update of, of where we are in the field and if we're advancing towards um, serologic data being practical and useful in, in surveillance and control. So we've we've talked a lot uh, over the past two days about um, surveillance guidance, using clinical cholera data to make decisions, and a lot that has come up about the cases where we don't have data, we don't have lab data, we don't have people adhering to suspected case definitions. And I would, I would make the assertion that in many places, we are running blind and trying to make decisions. Um, and even in places where we do have okay data, there are huge challenges in trying to understand um, the number of cases and, and um, the true incidents and comparing different places. The objective of, of surveillance systems in general is never to detect all cases, just to be clear. It doesn't matter if we detect all cases, but what matters is if we can track trends and understand populations at risk and compare populations to make decisions on where to allocate resources. Um, and, and as an example, if we, for, if we start on the right of this, this, uh, this image, um, this is showing the, the number of people that are identified and reported as cholera with this one, for every one person identified as a cholera case, um, that might represent many who didn't actually seek care and who represent um, only a fraction of infections that were actually symptomatic. So we have this cascade of people who are infected, only some of them are symptomatic, only some of them seek care, and only some of them are actually identified as cholera cases, suspected or confirmed. And so there's many biases that, um, that can creep in along this pathway, and what we have observed with our typical passive clinic-based surveillance systems is just those who arrive at the clinics and who we identify. Um, and as discussed throughout, it's, it's not only those who arrive at the clinic, but we also have diagnostics, which are imperfect. Um, and, and only about 50% of suspected cases overall are, are likely true cholera cases. Um, so both our case definitions and our diagnostics are, in, are imperfect. And so, for, for a number of years, uh, people have asked whether blood, uh, whether signatures of antibodies in, in serum can give us some clues about what's going on at the population level with cholera transmission. This is, this is not a new thing. This is, these are things that have been going on for quite a long time. This is just an example from the 70s. So even this idea of seroepidemiology or serosurveillance is not something that kind of emerged during the, the COVID pandemic, which it appears for many, um, many, many people think it had, um, but this is something people have been thinking about for quite a long time. Um, and for cholera, there are some particular challenges, um, and, and these challenges are actually similar for many enteric diseases. Um, and so for a classic vaccine preventable disease, maybe we can Think about diphtheria, antibodies. Once uh, someone is exposed or vaccinated, they have a rise in their antibody levels, and they, they more or less maintain um, elevated levels for a long period of time. And so that makes it easy to say, based on someone's um, antibody levels, whether they were ever infected or never infected, or either vaccinated or never vaccinated. Um, with cholera, unfortunately, we have, after infection, um, we have a rapid rise in antibody levels, followed by a, a fairly rapid decay, and we have quite a lot of variability in the rise and decay of these antibodies, and it makes it really hard to have a single threshold to say this person was ever infected or recently infected or not. Um, so at, at, to recap, faster decay, more variability in the baseline levels, high variability in post-infection antibody trajectories, and probably a single antibody with, um, measurement with a threshold is not going to do very well. So for the past number of years, we've been looking, we and others um, have been looking at characterizing antibody trajectories post-infection to understand how different uh, antibodies rise and decay after infection. 
um, and with the hopes of identifying different pathogen or different antigens that we might target uh, for measuring their antibodies to get a better idea of who was recently infected in a population and who was not. Um, and we characterize these and thinking about most of these analysis, thinking about their half-life, so how, how fast they decay and how big the boost is. Um, and one of the big markers that we've used for a long time are our vibrocidal antibodies, which have a fairly long half-life. This is shown in these black X's, so sometimes up to six months of half-life. Um, and there are other markers that have similarly long half-lives, um, like the cholera toxin and, and others. And so the goal in all of this is to estimate seroincidence. And when we say seroincidence, it's not necessarily a common term. And what we mean is the incidence of immunologically meaningful exposures to Vibrio cholera O1. So we don't distinguish between infections and exposures. We treat those, there, there's, it's really hard to say what an infection versus an exposure is, um, but it's, it's the frequency at which people have immunologic boosts in their um, immune system. And so what we can do is try to answer the question of what proportion of individuals were infected in the last X months. So we often think about estimating it in the last month, three months, six months, sometimes a year. Um, through work over the past years, we've narrowed in on a few different methods for, for measuring these antibodies. Uh, they can, the typical one that has been used for a very long time is a functional assay called the vibrocidal assay. Um, it's something that's been used not only in seroepidemiologic studies, but also in many vaccine evaluations. Um, and it's largely been treated as the gold standard but it's a very uh, labor-intensive assay and a lot of subjectivity is built into this assay. Um, and in more recent times, uh, we've shown that using the Luminex assay, which is a, an assay that's based on measuring antibody responses um, in, in beads, and it can be, um, can be done in fairly high throughput ways, and it can be combined with measuring other antibodies. And, and these Luminex assays seem to perform very similar, similarly to the vibrocidal assay. So we have multiple options. Um, and one big question, especially, I talked a bit about vaccination um, during this meeting, and, and vaccine is becoming more and more a, a, a tool in, in cholera response. And people rightly always ask, well, if we have a partially vaccinated population, how can you estimate incidence? Like you have people who have the vaccine, you have people who are exposed, both of them elicit antibodies. Um, from some recent work, we, we and others have shown that, um, that there is a differential antibody response between vaccinated and unvaccinated people, vaccinated and infected people in the first few months um, after infection or vaccination. And if you want to do, um, estimate zero incidence of the incidence of infections, we can do that if we understand uh, very, very reliably, if we um, know people's vaccination status. If we don't know people's vaccination status who, from whom we're collecting blood, after about three months after vaccination, um, the models, zero incidence models, don't really misclassify vaccinees as recently infected anymore. And so if you wait a few months after a vaccination campaign and do a sero survey, you're not going to misclassify vaccinees um, as infected people. And so just to give a few examples how this has been used over the past years, this is an example I've presented a, a few times at these meetings. Um, one of the, I guess, one of the first uses of, of these models where we took data from a national sero survey in Bangladesh to estimate the sero incidence of cholera. Um, in the country, what we found was that close to one in one in four, one in five, uh, one in six people in the country are um, exposed or infected every year. And we we see places like Dhaka, which are typically thought to be kind of hot spots of cholera transmission, not necessarily having higher um, relative infection risk than other places in the country, but having a lot of infection simply because they have a lot of people. Um, 
And another example is some recent work done, um, led by Flavio Finger and, and the MSPP in Haiti to understand the, the ratio of infections to cases. So it's, it's great that we can measure sero incidence, the number of infections are exposed, but it's nice, it's also important to be able to translate this into how many, how many cases we might expect. Um, how many cases every for every one infection? How many cases do we expect in the, to have occurred? And so this is um, fairly old data from uh, to, right after the introduction of, of cholera in Haiti in 2010. Um, in a community of Grand Saline, they did a sero survey um, about six months after the first wave and, and measured vibrocidal responses um, in the community. And we applied some, we, we, knowing that vibrocidal antibodies decay, we were able to correct for this decay to estimate the proportion of the population that was ultimately infected during that period. So this is shown in B, and we estimate that about over half, close to 60% of the population, or 55% of the population of over fives was infected in, in, in Grand Saline over the first six months of the, the epidemic. It was a lower attack rate in, in children. And what, interestingly, we found that um, among those over five, we have about one for every um, for every three for every three infections that occur in the community, only one of them will occur as a suspected case. Um, and for and that's for over five year olds. For two to four year olds, it appears that this ratio is about one to one. For every infection in the community, we have about one suspected case reported. And to contrast that, we've, we've also done some work in, in Bangladesh where we had both um, longitudinal serologic data collection um, and clinical surveillance in the same catchment areas. And we were able to combine those two to try to understand the true number of symptomatic cholera cases um, in the community and this ratio of infections to cases. And what we find is a very different picture from what we saw in Haiti. Remember, Haiti was an immunologically naive population. It hadn't experienced cholera before, and so had no pre-existing antibodies, et cetera. And we found, what, like I showed before, that it, for every three infections, there was, there was about one case. The contrast in, in Bangladesh, where we know there's a lot of transmission, we're finding about 800 infections per medically attended true cholera case. And for every 160 infections, we have one symptomatic infection. And for every five symptomatic infections, we have one medically attended true cholera case. So what's behind every single cholera case that we see and detect at a, medic, at a facility, um, in, for example, Bangladesh, represents so many, up to close to 1,000 infections that actually happen in the community. So as a, as a recap, I, those were a few examples of how they, these, these methods have and are being used. Um, so right now we, we have um, these laboratory methods of fibrocytals or Luminex available in, in multiple labs throughout the world, um, spanning US, Europe, um, Asia, and, and, and Africa. Um, and the analysis methods allow us to estimate sero incidence rates in the past six months, sometimes a year, often less reliable. Um, sero surveys in partially vaccinated populations are feasible with some attention to details. And there's ongoing work uh, by our group and other groups throughout the world looking at sero incidence and also some longitudinal uh, serologic studies in Nepal, um, Congo, Bangladesh, India, and Cameroon. So I think we'll have a lot more information and, and data coming out in the next year or so from, from a lot of places. In terms of looking forward, um, there's still some more work to be done in terms of standardizing uh, the data processing protocols. So the Luminex machine, which seems to be one of the more promising assays um, is very high dimensional data, very complex data, and, and it's coming up with standard ways and standard um, software to help process it, it will be very helpful. Um, availability of standard reagents. So right now, 
particularly for this luminex assay, the beads, which are the, the central component to the assay, are often um, conjugated where the, the antigens are put on them at uh, places like Mass General Hospital and, and Institut Pasteur, et cetera, and, and CDC. And, and that's not very sustainable as more and more people want to use this. And so trying to find more standard reagents is really important and making sero incidence estimation methods more standard. So having, um, having for instance, uh, software packages that, that can do this for you or web applications that can do this for you. We still have questions about what sero incidence means. We, we showed that this, this varies really greatly from highly endemic settings to naive settings, which wasn't surprising, but how do we translate this across different places and and what does it really mean in these highly endemic settings when we have a thousand infections um, and how does this translate to immunity um, and and thinking about immunity that this is very important if we start to do work on trying to forecast risk or try to say something about the risk of an outbreak based on historical cases or infections understanding um, a, a country or a community's baseline um, immunologic profile is really really important um, and we have an opportunity to collect a lot of new serologic data moving forward with this Luminex assay. Uh, there are many, especially since, since COVID, there's a lot of investments going into uh, multi-pathogen serosurveillance. And it's fairly uh, inexpensive to add some beads related to cholera, which many people are starting to do, to get some serologic data for cholera from a diverse group of places. And this is something... Um, just to highlight that people like PAHO are, are thinking very seriously about, they, they put out a really nice toolkit for integrated zero surveillance. And, and to just to point out, since uh, COVID happened, you see this is a search from PubMed, just looking at the, the increase in publications even mentioning zero surveillance. So it's something that is kind of trendy. And I, I think that we have a an opportunity to really capitalize on all of these efforts and to collect more data that can complement clinical surveillance data to give us a better picture of what's going on in, in communities. So I think that's all I have for you today. And I'm happy to take some questions. Merci Andrew for this presentation. It's extremely interesting. Euh, effectivement, et après, ce ne sont pas forcément des méthodes faciles à mettre en œuvre partout, mais euh, c'est clair que ça donne aussi de, des indications euh, intéressantes sur le nombre de cas euh, cliniques qui sont euh, les cas qui peuvent être sévères et les cas qui sont euh, porteurs, en fait, les porteurs, etc. Donc, euh, euh, merci beaucoup. Euh, je vais donner la parole aux personnes dans la salle, le Fran Francisco Liquero, qui avait une question. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Andrew. Sorry, I, oh, I got sorry. the mic. Um, Pardon, Andrew, I wanted to ask uh, what volume of blood is required or can this be done on dried blood spots? Because that's going to really impact the feasibility in communities to collect the specimens you want. That's a, that's a great question. So for the vibrocidal assay, we've, we have done some work Doing this assay um, from dry blood spots, I'm not convinced it's a great idea. For the Luminex, this is something many people are have shown that the Luminex for, for many different antigens works very well. We have collected some data from, from DRC and we're analyzing it right now to just confirm that uh, DBS can work just as well as, as serum and, and as venous blood. Um, so we have an expectation that there's no problems, but we need to, we would like to just publish and, and present data for the community to, to, to believe it for themselves. Thank you very much, Andrew, for the great presentation. Um, I, I think that you describe a very, uh, interesting, a new, uh, perspective about what asymptomatic infections mean for highly endemic countries like. Bangladesh, when there might be up to 1,000 infections per uh, case that is uh, uh, clinically reported as, as cholera, while in other settings, uh, high, uh, like new outbreaks, this fraction might be small. 
you made a very important point about the distinction between infection and exposure. And I think that this is one of the questions that needs to be further investigated. What does it mean to have the immunological signature? Is really infection or just exposure to the uh, to the uh, to, uh, to vibrio cholerae that leads to an immunological response? But the key question is, uh, do we have colonization and shedding? You know, and uh, my question is whether you are investigating about whether uh, these asymptomatic infections lead to shedding or not in some of your uh, upcoming studies. So that's the first question. And the second question is about, obviously you went to Bangladesh when there's hyperendemicity of cholera and whether you are trying to establish the same um, ratio of symptomatic to asymptomatic in other settings, in other endemic areas, uh, for instance, in Africa, where this uh, estimate can be as well highly relevant. So thank, thanks in advance, Andrew. Thanks for the great questions, Fran. Um, so the first question was whether I, whether we're trying to look at uh, shedding and whether people who have these frequent exposures are actually infected. And, and I think the bigger question is, are they actually protected? And is it different when you have perhaps like in an endemic setting, you could imagine they're they're like low inoculum exposures that just constantly exposed. And maybe that leads to different protection than a high inoculum exposure that you might expect during an outbreak in, in Haiti, for example. And one way to think about, one way that we could measure that as you suggested was, was perhaps looking at whether people that are, have these boosts um, actually shed vibrio collar in their stool. There are some data from, from some of the household studies, as you know, in, in Bangladesh that show some of this, that people do shed asymptomatically. Uh, what they might they show a fourfold rise, for example, in vibrocytals, and we can detect um, and we can detect uh, bacteria in their stool. Um, other times we don't detect it, or they, we, people have shown they don't detect it. We have some ongoing studies um, in in, in DRC that may help answer this question. And I believe that um, some ongoing studies through EPISONT may also provide some insights into this. Um, and the second question was whether we're doing looking at this kind of case to infection ratio anywhere else. Uh, in, in, in collaboration with Dr. Placid, who is there, we have a study in Uvira, um, in in South Kivu, in South Kivu province, where we have representative sero surveys conducted over the same in the same catchment area as clinical surveillance, so we will be able to have a similar estimate, uh, at least from one other location. We don't have anything else ongoing uh, to do something similar, uh, but I'm hoping that others um, may be able to help answer this question, like IVI and, and others involved in cholera research. Thank you. Oh, excuse me. Oh, sorry, I'm moving. Uh, sorry, just to interrupt a, a, a few seconds, it's just to uh, invite the group one to leave the room for the lab laboratory visits. Thank you very much, and, uh, and I'll leave you there. <laughs> This is group one, so it's on the on the paper there, and you received an email as well. If you have a doubt, thank you. Il y avait deux autres questions. Two other questions. Uh, Thank you so much uh, for the presentation. I think it was wonderful. I just have a, a, a question for you about the significance of this zero incidence or prevalence in the public health uh, uh, angle. What would be your and what would be your biggest recommendation for, let's say, a country that has this high zero prevalence or findings that are similar to what you have got? Thank you. This is Dr. Sauda from Uganda. Thank you. So I think one of the big uses for this um, can be, I guess there's two use cases that I can think of that are most practical and useful for public health. One is to track the, the actual level of sero incidence, I think is 
as I said, we don't really know how to interpret, you know, uh, 30% or 50% or 10% um, zero incidence, but across all settings. But I think tracking trends over time can help verify that things are going in a good direction. So we may not quite believe um, clinical surveillance data all the time. There are many places. It, it takes a lot more effort to fix a clinical surveillance system to really capture all cases and, and diagnose cases um, than it does to do a sero, to repeated sero surveys, I would argue. And this provides a complementary tool to give uh, some indication of how exposures are changing over time. Particularly if you improve wash conditions, I would expect that your thorough incidence levels should go down. Another use case for this that can feed into actual public health decision making is using this to help guide um, as, as an additional input into the PAMI or hotspot mapping process. These are data that are going to be less biased by care seeking and, and health, um, health systems, uh, weaknesses in the health systems that may be geographically variable. And um, this, this can kind of, this can provide complementary information. I think there needs to be a bit more work in places where these sero surveys are done, comparing maps of the sero incidents and the clinical incidents, especially in places where we have good faith that the surveillance system, the clinical surveillance system is capturing most medically attended cases. And that will give us some faith that the maps that we're making from sero incidents data or from sero surveys um, is really getting at the same thing. I, I hope that was clear.